Welcome to Day Tutor Academy, where we are devoted to building excellence in STEM education. Our video today is going to be focusing on the detailed solution to the WIAC 2019 Chemistry 3 paper, that is the practical. And we are going to be looking at the volumetric analysis, popularly called titration. We are going to be looking at the qualitative analysis, the identification of anions and cations. We are going to be looking at the theoretical questions based on our understanding of practical chemistry. So our work is done for us and I want you to just get set but if you are out there you are here to subscribe to our channel go ahead click on the notification icon click on the notification bell so that you will have our videos immediately we upload them and help us share these resources with your friends with your colleagues with your loved ones your younger ones we are devoted to building academic excellence in students and want you to partner with us let's achieve this together as we make our students better for the future that they are longing for. Here we are going to be looking at the iodometric titration or what is popularly called iodometry. It's actually a redox titration in which we use sodium thiosulfate as a reducing agent and in the practical world it is used to analyze the concentration of oxidizing agents in water samples. For example, you can use this to check the amount of active chlorine in swimming pool, water analysis and co. So what we have here is we are giving A to be a solution containing 15.8 gram per decimeter cube of so this is sodium thiosulfate and then we are giving B to be obtained by dissolving 9 grams of an impure sample of iodine in aqueous potassium iodide. The combination of this iodine and potassium iodide will give a thiodide, okay? But no problem. Our, our focus is not on that also. We just need to know that. Now the solution was made up to 1 decimeter cube. Is the step that we need to take to carry out the calculation now. First, we have to put A into the burette. A will be in the burette and try to it against 20 cm cube or 25 cm cube portions of B. So, meaning that we need to note what portion of B we are using based on our pipette. The pipette will be used to measure it. So, if you are provided with a 20 cm cube pipette, we need to know that. Or if you are provided with a 25 cm cube of pipette, we need to know that. Then we are going to use starch as the indicator. We are going to have a particular note to make on the indicator because we will not be adding this at the beginning. And even the question is, one of the questions we are giving is that we have to give reasons why the starch indicator was not added to the titration mixture at the beginning of the titration. So we need to follow along to know the reason why starch will not be added at the beginning. So doing that, we have to repeat the titration to obtain concordant theta values. This means that we don't just carry it out on a single step, okay? In short, we are going to have a rough, a first reading and a second reading. Then we'll tabulate the results, calculate the average volume of A since we are using some concordant values. And then we are giving the equation of the titration as this and that's going to help our work a lot. So, no problem. Let's go ahead and see how we can practically achieve this in our video for today. Let me clear the board here. So first, in trying to carry out this experiment, this is how our setup is going to look like. And here, let me just identify this. This is the sodium thiosulfate, okay? That is the solution A in the burette. So here at the top, clamped to the triple sand, okay, is the burette. And in the burette, we have the sodium thiosulfate. That is solution A. All right, and then solution B is the impure sample of iodine in aqueous potassium iodide. So here we have iodine, that's solution B. Now we can see the color. The color of sodium thiosulfate is this reddish brown, as indicated in the diagram. The colors for iodine is colorless. Okay, and then if you look at the burette, it is calibrated starting from the top so here you are going to have the initial reading initially to start from zero centimeter cube and then maximally it is on 50 centimeter cube but we are not going to exhaust it we are going to check the difference in the initial and the final that we'll get maybe somewhere here or whatever is going to be we are going to be checking that out so this is how we start the titration process but noting that the color of the solution in the conical flask is colorless and we are told that we are not going to add 
the indicator at the beginning of the titration process. So what we'll be noticing as we are releasing the sodium thiosulfate into the iodine solution. So we we'll release this valve, we we'll release this, and as we are releasing that, we have droplets of the sodium thiosulfate dropping into the iodine solution. Then we need to note the color change. The first thing we we'll notice is that the solution will turn yellow. Okay, so when the solution turns yellow, this is not the completion of our titration process. Now, this is the indication that now we can go ahead to add the starch solution. And that reason, we are going to give it in option C of the question. So, just pitch in and follow along as you are going to do that. So, immediately we see that the solution in the conical flask, after we have used some, you can see some thiosulfate, some sodium thiosulfate solution have been used up and then we are having yellow here, then we can go ahead and add the indicator. And once we add the indicator, now the solution will turn blue-black and it is turning blue-black as a reason of the fact that starch had been added to the solution as the indicator for the experiment. So after we are now seeing blue-black, we now just carefully add more portions of sodium thiosulfate and by the time we add more portions we are going to see a colorless solution again and then that is showing us that our titration process is complete at this stage okay if we stop at any point if we stop here it's not going to be complete if we stop here it's not going to be complete we need to go through these four processes for the iodometric titration and once we now obtain the colorless solution after adding the starch then we can know that our titration process is complete so doing this this is a practical aspect that we need to carry out i'm not going to take us through a detailed step on how to solve for all the questions that we have so let's go ahead and do that so here yeah, as a rule of thumb it is always ideal to show the parameters of what we are using like for the bread we use 50 centimeter cube bread okay so we need to show that we need to state the indicator that we use which is starch then we need to also indicate the dimension of the pipette that was used which is 25 centimeter cube for b so this is telling us that the volume of b is what is 25 centimeter cube we just need to know this because we are going to be using it in solving our question but now looking at the setup that we had initially this is the reading on the burette. So this is initial reading at the start of the experiment, which is zero centimeter cube. Okay. And then after we are seeing a colorless solution, knowing that our titration is complete, we are having this level of the solution A being used up in the burette. And then we can take that as the final reading. So it is this initial reading and the final reading that we need to tabulate to calculate the average volume of A that was used, all right? Now, initial reading was 0 cm cube, so we can put this as 0, 0.00. And then when the titration has been completed, we can take our final reading. Let's say that final reading for the rough was 14.00. So to get the volume used, we subtract 14 minus 0, okay? So here we are going to have 14.00 centimeter cube of solution A that was used for that rough experiment. Now we do rub because sometimes water droplets can be in the bread. And since we have now added the solution A full to the bread, that means it can flush out whatever droplet is there. And then we can have a clear setup to carry out our experiment. So the value for the rough, most, most of the times they are not used because they will even differ from the first and the second reading. So, to take the first reading, you know, our final reading had now reached 14.0 centimeter cube. So, here we have 14.00 centimeter cube. And we can use this because look at the whole size of the bread that we are using. It's what is 50 centimeter cube. 14 is now even up to one third of it so we can repeat it to carry out three experimental steps and we know that our 50 centimeter cube will not be used up 
okay if it will be used up then it's good that we top the bullet but here yeah, it's not going to be used up so we can just go ahead to try and take the final reading after we are now starting from 14.00 centimeter feet so let's say we have 27.50 okay so to get the volume of a that was used we need to subtract 0 minus 0 is 0 5 minus 0 is 5 then 7 minus 4 is 3 2 minus 1 is 1 so we have 13.5 centimeter cube okay and then for the third process which is the second reading that we are going to be making use of our initial value now will be this okay it will be 27.5 so you can see 27.50 and then after taking our reading let's say we have 41.00 and the subtraction will give us 0 5 so this will be 0 minus 7 that's 3 this is meaning 3 minus 1 minus 2 that is 1 so 13.50 centimeter cube and in generally the modality that our readings will take the first one will be a little odd but the other two they will be more consistent and then we need to find the average because we are told to calculate the average volume of A that was used for the experiment, okay? And then to calculate that average volume, we can just say the average volume of A used, average volume of A used will now be the average of these two, this and this. We are not going to make use of this because, like I explained before, that was a odd reading so we can say this is 1 over 2 of 13.50 plus 13.50 okay and that will give us 13.50 centimeter cube so in taking note of the values that we are taking for our experiment we can say yeah this is now amount to va okay so to continue our work let's note what we have been getting already we are saying that already we have gotten our va that we just calculated to be 13.5 centimeter cube and in the question initially we are told that we can use 20 or 25 centimeter cube portions of b but we use 25 so we can say our vb is 25.00 centimeter cube all right now in question b in question B here, we are being told that from our results and information provided, we are to calculate the concentrations of A in mole per decimeter cube. Okay? So, first we want to get, for B1, concentration of A in moles per decimeter cube. Okay? Now, to obtain the concentration of A in moles per decimeter cube, let's look at the value that we have been provided based on A. From the question, we are told that A contains 15.8 gram per decimeter cube okay, of sodium thiosulfate. Abi, then we have obtained volume of A to be what 13.50 centimeter cube. Okay. Now, what we need to do to obtain the concentration of A in mole per decimeter cube is to use the formula that the concentration is the mass over the molar mass okay mass over molar mass will give us the concentration of a mass is in grams okay molar mass is in grams per mole now since from the question we have been giving the grams here we have been given the grams per decimeter cube of a we can find the molar mass and use the two to actually obtain the value of the concentration of a and how do you find the molar mass of a we can say molar mass of A, molar mass of solution A is going to be the 
computation of the molar mass of each of the constituent elements and taking note of the number of the occurrence in this particular question. So, for example, we have 2 sodium plus 2 sulfur, okay, plus 3 oxygen. So, if you look at the question, we are giving the molar mass of oxygen as 16, of sodium as 23, of sulfur as 32, okay. So, that's what we need to input here. So, that will be 2, what's the molar mass of sodium? That's 23. Plus 2 multiplied by what's the molar mass of sulfur? That's 32. What's the molar mass of oxygen? That's 16. So, this is what we need to actually compute. And if you want to do that, you can just say 2 times 23 plus 2 times 32 plus 3 times 16. So that is 158. So this is 158 grams per mole. So since we have this and we have this, then we can go ahead to find the concentration of A. Okay. So to find the concentration of A, I can just say, meaning that the concentration of A, concentration of A is equal to, what's the mass that we're giving? I will put the unit so that you can get how we also get our unit in mole per decimeter cube. It will be 15.8, look at this unit, grams per decimeter cube, okay, over, what is this? The molar mass is 158 grams per mole, okay? So, if you look at this critically, 15.8 can go here, one, it can go in 158, that is 10, okay? So, that is equal to 1 over 10, but look at what we have. Gram per decimeter cube is, as if we are saying, gram over decimeter raised to power 3, okay? Then this division divided by grams over mole, because mole raised to power 1 is over. So this is, 1 over 10 is 0 0.1, okay? So we have gram over dm cube times mole over grams. So the grammage you cancel and we have this to just give us the concentration of A. So you can say the concentration of A is equal to 0 0.1 mole per DMQ. Okay? I love this. That is the concentration of A in mole per DMQ. So I can write CA is 0 0.1 mole per DMQ. Alright. So now we can look at our B2. We are now to calculate the concentration of iodine in B in mole per decimeter cube. Now, for us to do that, we need the equation of the titration. And we are told that I2 plus 2 S2 0, 3, 2 minus, you give us 2 I minus plus S4, O6, 2 minus. Okay, so if you are taking sodium thiosulfate as our A, okay, that means inherently this is A and iodine is B. And from the mole ratio, we know that CAVA over CBVB is equal to the number of moles of A over the number of moles of B. In this question, the number of moles can be equated to the coefficient of our constituent elements. And here, we have A to be 2. NA is 2 here. You can see that's 2. And NB, you can see we have 1 here because nothing is really written there. It's 1. But from our initial calculations, we have gotten VA, VA is 13.5, we have gotten VB, VB is 25, we have gotten CA, CA was just gotten to be 0 0.1 mole per decimeter cube, so we can definitely find CB, alright?
So what we just need to do is that to just express that from CAVA over CBVB is equal to NA over NB, we can just cross multiply and rearrange to have CBVB NA is equal to CAVA NB. But we are looking for CB, so we can divide both sides by VB and A such that here you can see VB and VB will cancel out, NA and NA will cancel out. And then what we we'll do to the left, we can do to the right. This will be over VB and A. Therefore, our CB can be CA, VA, NB over VB. We have these parameters, so we can just input them correctly to say CB, therefore, is equal to what is the concentration of A? It is 0 0.1 mole per dm cube. Okay. What is the volume of A? The volume of A is 13.50. What is the number of moles for B? That is, the number of moles for B is 1. Okay. That we have identified before to be 1. Then this is divided by what is the volume of B? The volume of B is 25.0. Then what is the number of moles of A? That is 2. So what we have here is 0 0.1 times 13.5 divided by 25 times 2. I can just say this is 0 0.1 times 13.5 times 1. 1 would not have any effect. So this would be 1.350. Over was this decimal place? We have fed this to bring decimal place forward. 25 times 2 is 50, so this is 50.0. So 1.350 over 50, 1.350 divided by 50, that's what 27 over 1000, 0.027. So that is equal to 0.027 moles. Per dm cube is more per dm cube because we are also calculating the ca the concentration of a from mole per dm cube so i can also populate my information to say cb i've also gotten to be 0 0.027 mole per dm cube all right okay and then we can find the last answer here, the percentage by mass of iodine in the sample. Okay, let's go ahead to do that now. So now in question number B3, okay, we are told to calculate the percentage, percentage by mass of iodine in the sample. Now, we are talking about iodine here, but for us to get the percentage by mass, look at this. The percentage by mass of iodine will be sample will be mass of iodine itself over the mass of the sample containing iodine. And what is that sample containing iodine? It is B. Okay, that's mass of B. Then multiply by hundred percent. Now, from the question, we have been given mass of B, mass of B was given as 9.0 grams as it was seen here okay but then we need to find the mass of iodine so how do you find the mass of iodine you know initially we calculated concentration to be mass over molar mass if we cross multiply this equation we can say mass is concentration times molar mass okay so, this is what we need to know. What's the molar mass of iodine? Molar mass of iodine will be 2 times, look at, look at the molar mass of a single entity of iodine, is 127. So, that will be 2 times 127.0 and that will be 254.0. Okay, then what's the concentration of iodine? The concentration of iodine 
is the concentration that we have gotten as CB. Okay, so that is that is CB. So we have concentration of B is what 0 0.027 mole per decimeter cube. Therefore, the mass that we are looking for now. So the mass of iodine that we are looking for is equal to the concentration as 0 0.027 moles per decimeter cube, okay, multiplied by the molar mass, that's 254 grams per mole, okay? So, if you are doing this, of course, the mole and the per mole will cancel out, so we are going to have grams per decimeter cube, no problem, that's actually what we are looking for, and that is going to give us this is going to give us if we bring in our calculator 0 0.027 that's our answer okay times 254 that's equal to what 6.858 so this is 6.858 gram per decimeter cube. but we are not stopping at the mass of iodine we are actually looking for the percentage by mass so percentage by mass of iodine in the sample is going to give us the mass of iodine that we just got here okay so that is 6.858 over the mass of solution b and what is that that is 9 okay multiplied by what 100 percent multiplied by 100 percent and if we bring in our calculator again are going to see the, our answer again divided by 9 times 100 so this is 76.2 so that is 76.2 percentage so this is the correct answer correct solution to this question that we are asked and with that we have gotten all the answers to be so here you can see our percentage iodine i'm just trying to write out all this so that we can see it for easy referral is 76.2 percent all right and with that we are true with that particular one also okay so finally in question number c we have to give the reasons why the starch indicator was not added to the titration mixture at the beginning of the titration so yeah you know i was giving us this illustration initially that is the addition of starch as an indicator that turned this to blue black now the blue black is a coloration of a complex this is a starch complex and if we do that at the beginning of the experiment the experiment is not going to give us the accurate um, values that we want to show. so we did this the reason why starch indicator was not added to the titration mixture at the beginning of the end is to avoid the formation of the complex of a starch complex which will yield wrong results. So, it's because we want to avoid that. That is why the starch as the indicator was not added at the beginning of the titration. And with this, we have come to the end of the solution on this iodometric titration process from the Y 2019 chemistry practical. Here in this question, we are going to be looking at the qualitative analysis from the Y 2019 chemistry practical exam and that means we are going to be looking at the identification of anions and cations from two inorganic compounds so we are told is an the compound we are identifying are inorganic compounds so we have two of them that are mixed together in a mixture that is called C okay so we have to carry out the following exercises on C we should record our observations and identify any gases involved we need to take note of this Whatever you observe, we need to actually record it. So, 
that's what will hand you the correct mark in your chemistry practice. Then you need to state the conclusion C. You need to state the conclusions that was drawn from the results of each test. It's not going to be a general conclusion. From each test, we are going to state the results, the conclusions that were drawn from that particular test. So, these are the things we are going to be doing divided into three steps A, B, and C that we'll be looking at. So, first, we're to put all of C in a boiling tube and add about 10 cm cube of distilled water. So, that's the solution of the solid. We have to shake thoroughly and filter, then keep both. No, this is highlighted. We need to note that we keep both the residue and the filtrate. And as a rule of guide, this is the diagram showing what we are going to do in that case. So here, after putting C, which is the mixture of twin organic compounds, in a boiling tube as shown here, okay, then we had 10 centimeter cube of distilled water, no problem. We have to shake thoroughly and filter. So this is the exercise that is requested from us to carry out in the A part of the question. So in filtering, what we are going to get is we are going to get the residue, which is a solid part. So here you, are, you can see that as the residue. And then we are also going to get the filtrate, which is the soluble part. Okay. So we have the residue and the filtrate. And we have to keep both of them. Now, as we are doing that, we need to note what's the color that we are observing, okay, from this particular, maybe from the residue or from the filtrate, and that is what we are going to tabulate in our table of results and draw our conclusions from there. So that's A. In B, we are to add to about 2 cm cube of the filtrate. So, you know, this is the filtrate. So we take 2 cm cube of that and that few drops of silver triazonitrate 5 followed by dilute HNO3. So in the first step, we do this and note what we are observing and record them appropriately. Then we have to add SS ammonia solution, that's aqueous ammonia, to the resulting solution in number 2B1. That is what we are getting from here. We had SS ammonia solution to that. So so the pitot we are going to be having there is something like this. So here we have B. Now this is the filtrate. This is the filtrate that we are talking about. Then first, like in the first case, we are to add silver nitrate. So silver nitrate will be added here. So that will be first dropped. And then that's going to be followed by HNO3. Okay. So that's the first thing we'll do. And then we're going to follow it with aqueous ammonia added to that particular solution. And then whatever we are noticing in the first case and in the second case, we have to note it and record it appropriately. And then in C, we have to put the residue in a test tube. So the residue that is the solid part, and add about two centimeter cube of dilute hydrogen chloride, and we have to shake it together. All right. Then we had ammonia solution in drops to the mixture, and then in SX. So this is the kind of thing we are going to be looking at here. This is C now. Now this is the residue. And then in the first case, all we need to add is 2 cm cube dilute HCl. And then in the second case, to the solution we obtain from one year, from one year to the solution that we obtain, we are to add sodium hydros, we are to add aqueous ammonia in drops to the mixture and then in SS. So we have ammonia solution in drops then ammonia solution in SS alright so these are the steps that we need to carry out to ensure that we follow the instructions that we are given following the instruction set is key in obtaining the right solution in your chemistry practice if you miss any of the step 
definitely your solution is going to be wrong. So that's why I took time to just highlight this for you to know the things to do and carry them out appropriately. So after having done this, the results are going to be tabulated and that's what I'm going to be showing in the next set of steps I'm going to be taking, okay? So we can look at our table of observations and the inference that we can take from there, all right? So here in the first case, if you have C plus distilled water, and filtered okay what observation are we noticing what we notice is that c we partially dissolve so you partially dissolve in water with some green residue and you know residue is a solid part and the colorless free trait. So, this is the way that you take your observation in your experiment. And from this observation, what is the inference that we are drawing from there? For C to partially dissolve with green residue and colorless free trait, what we need to take note is the green, okay? Now, this is unique. This is unique. The residue being green implies that either ion 2 plus or copper 2 plus is present in the particular solution. So that is the understanding of what the solution will do for us that to have a green residue. Colorless retreat, numerous numerous compounds can give us colorless retreat, but for the particular green residue that we are noticing, that means ion 2 plus or copper 2 plus is present in the mixture that we identify as C, all right? So that's the inference that we need to draw from this first question that we are being asked here in A. So we'll go to the next one and see what we can also get from there. So here, yeah, I've drawn out the table of the experiment that is being carried out as requested in option B, okay? Now we are to have two centimeter cube of the filtrate. The filtrate that is the soluble part, and we are to add few drops of silver trouser nitrate five, followed by dilute HNO3 to that particular filtrate. So, in the first case, when we add silver nitrate to the filtrate, what will be noticed is a white precipitate will be observed. White precipitate is observed. And now we need to understand how silver nitrate reacts with such filtrates to give white precipitate. Generally, silver nitrate is used to precipitate the halides, that's bromine, iodine, chlorine, then CO3 2 minus, SO3 2 minus, and the sulfide ion. Okay, but out of all those, the ones that give white precipitate, which we are noticing is only the set that includes chlorine co32 minus so32 minus or the sulfide ion so any of these four is present because they are the ones that give white precipitate with silver nitrate so moving on now we are to add from this particular resulting solution in b1 from this one we are now going to add dilute HNO3 and notice what we observe. The observation that will come from that is that the precipitate will be insoluble. Precipitate is insoluble or we can say no visible change observed. You know, we don't know the chemical process that is going on but at least we can say that we didn't see any visible change because the precipitate remains. If the precipitate remains, then the only inference we can bring from there is that we are being able to eliminate CO32 minus, SO32 minus, and sulfide ion. So chlorine ion is present in that particular 
filtrate, which is the liquid part of the mixture after we have carried out our filtration. Okay, so that is the first activity that we are requested to carry out. That's B1. In B2, we're now to add excess ammonia solution, that's ammonium hydroxide, to the resulting mixture in 2B1. And you see, that is what is highlighted there. The resulting mixture in B1 above plus excess ammonia. So the excess ammonia solution will give us a soluble. So we have the precipitate is soluble. And the fact that the precipitate is soluble is confirming that chlorine is present in C. So out of that mixture, we have chlorine to be present or in short, I can say chlorine is confirmed. Chlorine is confirmed as present in the mixture C that we are testing for. Okay, so so that means that the set of experiments that we we'll carry out in B is testing for the anion that is present in that particular mixture, and we can see that chlorine is confirmed to be present. We we'll now move to the question C and see what we can get. So here we have our set of experiments to be carried out and the table of observation and inference that we can draw from there. First, in C1, we are told to add dilute HCl to the residue. When we do that, what we observe is that the residue dissolves. So it, it, it was a solid. It dissolves to form blue solution. To form blue solution. And if it's forming blue solution, then that means copper 2 plus may be present. Okay. There is a video that we did on the identification of cations. You can check that out to see how to differentiate between the various identification of cations. But whenever you are seeing the color blue in the addition of your reagents, that means the copper may be present. There is still a confirmatory test to be carried out with that. But let's just notice for us to see blue, that means copper 2 plus may be present in the particular solution. But then that's not the only observation that will be noticed when we add dilute HCl to the residue. We also noticed that there was effervescence, so gas was given off. There was effervescence and colorless, odorless gas was evolved which turns lime water maker which turns lime water maker okay even though we are not asked to test with lime water we can also bring in the addition of um, litmus paper, red litmus paper, blue litmus paper to check if it is acidic or basic. But whenever we see gas, we also need to test for that gas. So here, when we are seeing effervescence, and we notice that the colorless sodalous gas was evolved, we pass that gas to lime water, and the turning of the lime water to milky color means that the gas is CO2. Gas is CO2, which is coming from a CO3. 2 minus ion. Okay, so meaning that from the mixture, we also have CO3 2 minus as one of the anions present in the mixture. You know, this was suspected initially, but we confirm chlorine. So the other anion, since we are told that they are a mixture of two inorganic compounds, the other anions there definitely is CO3 2 minus. The first one we got was chlorine, the second one is CO3 2 minus. So now, what about the Addition of the mixture from two and above, when we had ammonia in drops, when we had ammonia solution in drops, a light blue precipitate is formed. So here we have a light blue precipitate is formed. And that means that copper 2 will be present. 
But the confirmatory is that that LIBO precipitate we have to dissolve in excess of ammonia to give a deep blue solution. Okay, so here yeah, what we notice is precipitate dissolved with deep blue color okay and if we have that deep blue color we have that deep blue solution that means copper 2 plus is confirmed to be present in the mixture that we are testing for so this is this is the way to go about working with qualitative analysis even though the experiment was not carried out here but we have an idea of what the observations are going to be looking like and then we can draw the inference from there. Following these steps are critical. Presenting your results in a well-informed manner, noticing all the observations is what is going to end your full marks and you can always use this as a guide for your practical chemistry examinations. All right. Yeah, in the theoretical aspect of our question from Y 2019 Chemistry Pratica, we are first in question 3A. So this is question 3A. And let's take the first part. We have to state what to be observed when barium chloride solution is added to a portion of a saturated sodium carbonate followed by diluted Cl in excess. First, with the addition of barium chloride to a portion of the saturated sodium carbonate, what we will notice is that a white precipitate is formed. A white precipitate will be formed. And that is because there is a formation of barium carbonate. But after we are adding dilute HCl in excess, then what we notice is that the precipitate dissolves. The precipitate dissolves on the addition of dilute hydrogen chloride in excess but that's not all with effervescence there'll be a release of some gas so there'll be effervescence meaning that gas is re released and if you really want to understand this what is happening is this we have barium chloride reacting with sodium carbonate in the first case and what we are going to have is barium carbonate which is a solid and sodium chloride which is being dissolved in the solution that's aqueous so that's what happened in the first case so this is this is the first thing that we notice now, on the addition of SS dilute HCl, what we notice is that the barium carbonate, which is solid, will now react with the hydrogen chloride in SS as aqueous and it's going to give barium chloride that soluble, so it's aqueous, plus water, of course, water is liquid, and then carbon dioxide is going to be giving us as a gas so this is the effervescence that we are noticing and the white precipitate this is the barium carbonate that is the white precipitate the solid but it's going to dissolve in excess hydrogen chloride to give barium chloride water and effervescence is the release of co2 so that's what will happen when we are adding barium chloride to a saturated solution of the saturated portion of sodium carbonate followed by diluted Cl in SS. So here in question 3A2, we are being asked that a gas Q decolorizes acidified KMnO4 solution. We are to suggest what Q could be. KMnO4 itself is an oxidizing agent. So what we take care of it in such a way to decolorize it is a reducing agent and the most suitable reducing agent that normally decolorize as if I came in for is sulfur dioxide. That's what we turn the color as if I came in for to colorless. That's the ideal solution. So I can just say 
Okay, let, let me put it this way. So, Q could most likely be most likely be sulfur dioxide. Okay, now other substance that have the ability to do that, though it may not really, really give us a clear colorless result, is hydrogen sulfide. Okay, but it will be sufficient to say we have SO2 and you get your correct mark. All right. So here in question number 3b, we are to name one substance in the first case, we are to name one substance that is used in the laboratory for drying ammonia gas. So to dry ammonia gas, we use solid calcium oxide. So solid calcium oxide, which is in lump that is popularly called quick lime, is used to dry ammonia gas because ammonia will react with other drying agents so solid calcium oxide is used and then to dry carbon four oxide we make use of fused calcium chloride fused calcium chloride or concentrated h2so4 so these are the dry agents for ammonia gas and carbon four oxide respectively and then finally our last question 3c we are to give the reason why a given mass of sodium hydroxide pellets cannot be used to prepare a standard solution. The reason is that sodium hydroxide pellet itself is deliquescent, okay? So we say the sodium hydroxide pellet is deliquescent. What do we mean when we say something is deliquescent? Sometimes you say, you hear people say it is hygroscopic. So, whether they're liquescent or hygroscopic, what they are referring to is that it absorbs water from the air. And particularly for sodium hydroxide pellet, it absorbs water and carbon dioxide from the air. And that we add to the mass, so it cannot be used to prepare a standard solution. So, that is all the solution to these practical questions from chemistry 2019 paper 3 exam and i know the journey has been quite eventful we've learned quite a lot we've talked about iodometry we've talked about identification of anions and cations using chemical reagents we've answered questions on theoretical understanding of practical chemistry and all this are geared towards preparing you for academic excellence like i said before if you are here to subscribe to our channel just take a minute it's free of charge Go ahead, click on the subscription icon, click on the notification bell, like the videos. That's the feedback that we'll get to know that what we are doing is actually what while is making impact out there. And don't forget to share these videos with your loved ones, with your friends, with your relatives, so that we can build academic excellence in students together. It's Day to Academy, and until next time, God bless you.